Peggy 16. Hi, I'm Julien Pirou. I'm one of the writers and designers uh, working at Ubisoft on the current Might and Magic and Heroes games, especially Might and Magic Heroes 7. But today, uh, it's the 20th anniversary of the franchise, and I am with a special guest, John Van Kennegan, the creator of Might and Magic and Heroes. Thanks, Julien. It's great to be here. So, uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, what you're doing currently? Yeah, so I recently started a new company, and it's called uh, VC Mobile Entertainment, and we're working on uh, mobile games. So fantasy, strategy, I think a lot of the fans would uh, be happy to see the new games we're creating for tablets and, and phones. So Might and Magic Heroes, or Heroes of Might and Magic as it was called originally, uh, is celebrating its 20th anniversary uh, this year. The first one was released in 1995. So how do you feel as a creator of the franchise uh, of this anniversary? Wow, 20 years, that's pretty exciting. I uh, never would have imagined it when we created the first one in 1995. And it's just so exciting to, to be here and having new games being made. Can you tell us about how the, basically how Heroes came to be, uh, how it was born? Oh wow, it's quite a, it's quite a long tale, but I'll, I'll try to get through it quickly here. Uh, originally, uh, I was a big fan of strategy games as well as role-playing games. And I played a lot of board games and uh, a lot of strategy games. And my first attempt at making a computer strategy game was actually King's Bounty which some people refer to as the prequel to, to actually Heroes. And uh, King's Bounty was quite a uh, critical success, but not as much as a financial one. So we kind of put it on the side and said, all right, I'll stick to role-playing games for a while. But we had so much fan feedback and kept asking for a sequel, make a new strategy game, please. I said, all right, finally I'm going to do one. And we decided to make uh, Heroes 1. And uh, I took a lot of the concepts I had learned, uh, from Heroes, from, uh, sorry, from King's Bounty, and uh, was, came up with this name called Heroes. And uh, originally that was just going to be the name of the game. And ironically, when we went to go to uh, market it, uh, we couldn't get much attention. And that's when we decided to, all right, well, let's borrow from the RPG series and let's make it Heroes of Light and Magic, and maybe we'll get some shelf space. Hmm. And uh, really, that's how the, the game was born. So originally, uh, Heroes was not supposed to be basically uh, part of the Might and Magic universe. Yeah, so it wasn't planned to be linked at the time, but once we, we gave it the name, then we thought it deserved to have uh, characters and uh, references to the RPG series, and then it all just started to fall into place. And from, uh, from a storyline and from a character point of view, it just made sense to start combining the two series. Compared to King's Bounty, uh, Heroes is much more of a strategy game with castles to take, territory to conquer, resources and so on. So that, that was really what you were aiming at with this game. Absolutely. I really wanted a strategy game that you could start, play through, and uh, finish and win, and then start over and try different uh, strategies and tactics and different difficulty settings. Resource management, exploration, a little bit of RPG. It was fun to just pull all that together in, in a fantasy theme. Uh, it was very exciting. And that's a lot of different ingredients to put together in the same game. So uh, how challenging was it to make the first Heroes? It was actually very challenging. Uh, in fact, building the first game, of course, you, know, you have to build the engine first. And no one really even knows how the game is going to play while you're doing that. So we had a lot of doubting, doubting uh, players or, and, and testers at the office. And ironically, uh, very close until the game was actually finished, uh, people didn't even think it was very good. The magic kind of came together in the last uh, last few weeks uh, as we got the game actually working and worked out some of the play and the scenarios. But it was a long haul, and you had to have faith for a very long time to uh, to get that game done. And do you have a specific anecdote or, or story that occurred during the development of Heroes One that you can share with us? Oh wow, there's there, there's probably so many, but uh, uh, let's see. I, I, you know, I, three weeks before the game was going to ship people were like they said this game wasn't any fun. I think that was the, the hardest one for me to get through. And then magically, we made some changes on the, the difficulty and the pace of the game and some of the distances heroes could move. And then all of a sudden, the game came alive. And uh, when, I, when I saw the QA department couldn't stop playing, then I, then I knew we did it. And I knew it was ready to go. So from this first Heroes of Might and Magic uh, came Heroes 2, which was, in many ways, I guess the, the, real, the real moment where Heroes 
exploded. Uh, so can you tell us about Heroes 2? Yeah, so uh, Heroes 1 was quite a, a mountain to climb to actually make because we had to build the engine and the editors and uh, the amount of time left to actually build scenarios and balance was, was small. Heroes 2 was very exciting to start because we already had the technology and the engine. Now we could just add to it and make the gameplay deeper and more characters. So the whole development uh, period was uh, a lot of fun and a lot of playing. Heroes 1 and 2 were not so heavy on the RPG side. Uh, I mean, the skills uh, appeared only in Heroes 2 and they were quite uh, limited compared to how it evolved later. And I think uh, it's really the expansion pack that took the series to a more RPG direction. So what did you feel about that? That was really quite interesting uh, during the development of the game. Uh, originally, Heroes was set out to be just a strategy game and not an RPG. Yet, once we got to the uh, first expansion for uh, Heroes 2, uh, it went in definitely in a direction of more role-playing uh, scenarios. And we found that the fan base actually, instead of you know, shrinking, it actually grew five-fold. So we had people who really enjoyed the RPG line of scenarios and others who enjoyed the strategy, and it just made the audience to the game uh, just that much bigger. And it was quite surprising, but actually quite a lot of fun. So there's a uh, funny but maybe not so surprising coincidence uh, that uh, on Euro 7, the six factions we have, uh, two of them have been actually voted by the community, are essentially the six faction of Euros 2. So uh, in your opinion, what makes these six factions so magical? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I know when we were creating the first few games, we had a lot of debates on how many factions and where the creatures and the characters would belong. And for some reason, the six groupings just turned out to be a magic number and uh, it just made sense from a strategy point of view. And I know there's been a lot of previous board games I played that six was kind of a magic number for sides too. So it's really interesting how Heroes evolved that way and now you're saying that the fans want that back and of course you've done it now with uh, Hero 7. So that's pretty cool. From a, a production uh, point of view, uh, what, what was the size of the team back on Heroes 1 and 2? Uh, how many people worked on these games? Oh wow, I think Heroes 1 probably is 10 to 15 people wasn't really very large. Uh, maybe expanded to close to 20 near the end. Uh, Heroes 2 got considerably uh, larger, and I think Heroes 3 might have peaked uh, at 50 plus uh, people towards mm -hmm. the end. So actually, uh, that's a great transition to Heroes 3, which is still to this day the, the, the episode that fans always mention and, and bring back into the conversation. Uh, in, why, why do you think Heroes 3 uh, became such a great success. I think it's really the pinnacle of the Hero series. We took everything we had learned from the first two and added to it with some more modern graphics and we created a new editor from scratch, which I think was a big part of the Hero series for players to be able to create their own scenarios and map. And we spent a lot of time on the, on the editor and just a lot of time on game balance, a lot of time on uh, details and just we put our all into it. We really loved making that game. It was, it was a lot of fun. Heroes 3 went on to become very successful. It had several uh, expansion packs. So the Heroes Chronicles also uh, gave more uh, experience to the fans. Um, and uh, um, how do you explain basically the, the impact it had on players? I don't know. It's, it's, it's quite magical, actually. I still meet people today who tell me how they've that was their whole college career was playing Heroes with their friends. And uh, it's really quite amazing. That game has stood the test of time, and still even today people play it, and uh, uh, I don't know. Sometimes you just hit it right on the money and it, it all works. It's really hard to explain. And actually, uh, in, in Heroes 3 especially, there are some heroes that are familiar faces. Uh, Sir Christian was actually Chris Vanover, one of the members of the team. Uh, David Mullick became, became Sir Mullick in the game. Uh, are there other characters or heroes that, that come back to you and that have a special history like that? Well, yes, I think a lot of them in the game were employees and uh, or old characters from uh, other Might and Magic games or previous Heroes uh, games or uh, some of them were actually characters that uh, many of the employees played as their role-playing characters when they played role-playing games. So it was a labor of love and people wanted to put themselves into the product as well. Uh, and of course I was Sir Canigam, they always put me on things, so I didn't mind. And, and I think Kragak was actually your pen and paper character originally. Yeah, that's correct. That goes all the way back to 
high school days when I used to play paper and pencil RPGs, I had a character called Crag Hack, and I think he's lived through all the uh, Might and Magics and Heroes games. It's, it always gives me a laugh when I hear that. The Heroes series, especially, had um, for a very, very long time a very involved community. Uh, I think even back when it was Heroes 2 and 3, there was a video of forums with uh, a lot of people already discussing and debating the games. So how was it to work with the community back then? Oh, it was quite interesting and uh, it was a lot of fun as well. We used to have a saying at the office, uh, they were always asking for all these features and all these concepts, but we really had to figure out why they were asking for it as opposed to just dumping those features in and then uh, anytime we tried that it didn't go very well. But uh, it was fun, there were a lot of very vocal uh, people as obviously you have now. and. Uh, uh, very passionate fans, which is always a great thing to have. One, one thing that really uh, came to light uh, recently is the uh, size of the Russian and Chinese fan communities, and I think that's something you maybe not didn't realize back back in New World Computing days. No, it's actually quite amazing that years later, uh, hearing from many uh, Russian uh, companies and communities, and uh, with recent visits to China, and hearing about how they all knew about Heroes of Might and Magic and played in tournaments. And of course, back then, uh, we didn't sell any games to those territories, so they were all pirated. But uh, it turns out millions of people played this game uh, and the series of games through many years in these territories. And they just absolutely adored it. And they, they loved it. And still, even today, some are still playing. Uh, it, was, it was quite a surprise that the audience for this game was so much larger than we had ever even realized. For you personally, which heroes is your favorite and why? Well, that's almost like asking which your favorite <laughs> child, right? Um, but uh, I think Heroes 3 was probably the pinnacle uh, of the Heroes uh, games for me. Uh, I think I spent the most time on that one. But also Heroes 2 has a special, special moment for me because I did so much of the detail work in doing all the maps and the scenarios. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of tied between those two. But if you made me pick, I'd probably pick Heroes 3. One thing, uh, earlier we were talking about the, how Heroes was not supposed to be connected to Might and Magic, but after Heroes 2, basically, the world of Heroes became the world of the Might and Magic RPG, so it was sort of a reversal of, uh, of things. Uh, so how, how did you decide, basically, to base the Might and Magic RPGs on the Heroes universe? Well, so the Might and Magic RPG series uh, came to a pinnacle at World of Zine after Might and Magic 5. And the story had ended, and I was a little done with role-playing games at that point, and I was 100% focused on strategy games, which became Heroes. And then as Heroes uh, grew to be such a huge success, it became the lead project, actually, and Might and Magic uh, RPGs were then following. So whatever we wanted to use for Heroes was fair game, and it became the lead world, and. We borrowed uh, lore and characters from the Might and Magic series, and that's how they became intertwined. In the early Might and Magic titles, there was this sort of sci-fi background. Uh, it was usually well hidden, or you only discover it at the end of the games. But with Heroes 3 Armageddon's Blade, the, the first expansion pack, originally the plan was to bring that back into Heroes with the Forge faction. But this time, the fans were not so happy about this. Uh, so, can you tell us about basically this, how, how this turned out? Oh, I thought it was fun. I, I think in a strategy game it's, it's okay to introduce things and, and try them out, and uh, if you don't want to use them, it's fine. And of course, the Might Magic RPG series had a little bit of sci-fi, as you remember, at the very end, kind of hidden underneath all of the fantasy. So, uh, bringing that to Heroes was, seemed like a natural, but it was, again, amazing, the fans' response of, get your sci-fi out of my fantasy game. <laughs> some of the diehards, so that was, it, it was fun. In your opinion, basically, what is the magic recipe that, that made Heroes so appealing and, and, and even addictive to, to players uh, during these two decades? What, what, what is the secret ingredient? I think the passion of the uh, development team uh, working on the game was a big part of the, the magic that came out of it. Uh, we all loved working on it and we loved playing it, and I think that really came through in the quality and the uh, the end result on the product. Uh, I also think putting in the editor so players could enjoy the game and then modify it themselves and uh, really continue to uh, interact with the game for a long time to come after that. Those are some, I think, of the, the magic elements. And of course, fantasy is a 
worldwide, very, very uh, popular. And you add that with a balanced game, and I think you have something that people are going to enjoy for a long time. One of the pillars of Euros uh, so far has always been the fact that it's a turn-based game. And, uh, but I guess that with the strategy market having more and more real-time games, uh, there have been some uh, temptation to go real-time with Euros. So did that actually happen? Was it considered? Yeah, that's quite a, a, an interesting topic. And as the heroes evolved through one, two, and three, and then computers were getting faster and more people were playing real-time games, there was a lot of pressure, actually, that we should move heroes to a real-time strategy game as opposed to a turn-based. And the market was fewer and fewer turn-based games, and everyone was releasing real-time games. And uh, we almost did it. We were actually very close to turning heroes into a real-time strategy game. But at the last minute, I said, you know, this game, I wanted to keep it pure to what it was, and I said it's going to stay a turn-based strategy game. And uh, I believe us and uh, Civilization were the only two real big games that stayed uh, as a turn-based game to this date, and uh, I'm really happy we made that decision. There have been actually some games that may have been influenced a bit by Heroes, so, so was it something you actually saw uh, in, in other strategy games and you say, oh, actually, that's, I recognize a bit of my game in, in that. Yes, in fact, I do think there's a lot of games that uh, uh, borrowed or copied uh, from the Hero series, and I think it's the greatest form of flattery, and uh, it was, I was excited to see it. It was actually pretty awesome. So in, I think it was in 2004, maybe, uh, Ubisoft acquired the Might and Magic uh, IP, uh, and, uh, and from their new games, both Heroes, uh, Might and Magic, Dark Messiah, Clash of Heroes, and so on, have been made in this, uh, in this brand. So uh, did you play them? Did you keep track of, of these games? Oh, absolutely. I was very excited to hear that uh, Ubisoft picked up the licenses and that they were going to make new products. Uh, that was very exciting to me that my games were going to live on. And um, yeah, I, I think that uh, back when Euros 5 was starting at Ubisoft, uh, actually uh, you were approached to maybe take part in some capacity to, to this project. But at the time, it, it didn't happen. So can you tell us a bit why? Well, I was busy at the time uh, working in a new company and new games. And uh, I thought it was very flattering. And uh, I would have wanted to, but I couldn't uh, have dedicated my entire time to it. So we decided not to, not to work together. So right now we are in the last uh, sprint for, for before releasing Might and Magic Heroes 7. Uh, did, did you have the chance to, to see what, what the game uh, was shaping, shaping up to, to be? Well, I've been following it a little bit, and I'm obviously very excited to see it come out. And like with the previous uh, Ubisoft games, I've been waiting to actually play the final game is the way I like to do it. So can't wait to play it. It's, I'm very excited. On Euro 7, we are trying to involve the community uh, a lot in the development process with this Shadow Council website when we ask them to vote for factions, for creature design, and so on. Um, but I was wondering, what, what's your opinion of this open development philosophy that we see more and more uh, nowadays in video games? Oh, absolutely. And uh, it's quite commendable to actually do that, because I know how difficult it can be. But with a game with this type of history and the passion of the fans, I think it's a terrific thing to do. Um, I hope you do more of it. What, one thing we've said about Euro 7 is that it's a bit of a best of Euros, basically our favorite features and, and ideas from all the past uh, installments of Euros, as well as some new ideas, of course. Um, what, what, what would be your best of Euros? What are your favorite features of the Euros games? Wow, that's, uh, that's a lot of features, but uh, I'd have to say a well-balanced game that I can play over and over again with a lot of difficulty settings, obviously beautifully uh, created, and of course having an editor where, where people can uh, create, put themselves into the game. So this year is Euro's 20th anniversary, but next year will be Might and Magic 30th anniversary. Uh, so looking back, on all these years, uh, you, you've really been witness of the evolution of the video game industry. So what, what's your opinion on video games nowadays and where the industry is going? I think it's great to have been involved with the industry for so many years. And wow, 30 years next year for the original Might and Magic? That's crazy. I can't even believe it. But uh, I think games have, for the most part, remained the same and what people like and the systems uh, involved. The graphics get better. and. Now we have more interconnected games with the internet, uh, but 
Uh, it's really been pretty cool to watch the evolution of games over this, uh, over this long period and to see something like Heroes and Might and Magic continue to be uh, played this long. Uh, you know, I really can't tell you how great that feels. So, so to conclude this interview, I have actually some questions from our VIP fans. VIP fans? I'm in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to create Might and Magic today, would you still mix fantasy and science fiction together? I think on the RPG series, yes. I think it was part of the original uh, canon for the game that uh, there was a little hidden sci-fi at the very end of the RPG. That was really the story I created at the beginning. I think it was in Might and Magic 3, so Eyes of Terra. At the very end, in the ending sequence, it's, there's a mention of uh, the creators being the ancients, arch enemies, basically. Uh, and so fans are wondering if the creators and the Kriegans are the same beings. Well, no, the Kriegans were uh, a different race we created to, to do invasions and cause havoc. Uh, and the creators originally started off as uh, just loosely uh, the development team at the office. Well, we were the creators. And then as the fans started to read and, uh, and play the games, they started to interject ideas and it actually stirred our uh, imagination and then we made more out of the creators than just the guys at the office uh, writing the code. But, um, well, we, right now we're talking about the ancients, or because in Mind Magic 3 it seems it implies that creators are like the nemesis of the ancients, and it, it was never mentioned ever again. No, sure. Uh, in fact, the creators and the ancients were kind of the same thing originally. Mm. Uh, they were us at the office, and then as the fans responded to uh, the the concept and the lore and the mythology, we started to build it into the actual games and the history. Another question, a bit of the same type, really, uh, that um, Greg Fulton, uh, who was a writer on Mighty Magic Heroes 3, uh, mentioned in, 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 on a forum or something that angels were maybe like cyborgs, or it, it was hinting that there were some dark secrets behind the angels of Heroes 3. Uh, what, was it actually just a, a joke, or was it were, were angels really something scary? Well, as far as I know, I think that was just a joke. Angels were just another fantasy creature that we had in the game, but uh, you never know what Greg was thinking. He came up with a lot of crazy ideas. <laughs> Did you ever give a specific name to the planet where the heroes 1, 2, 3, and Magic 6, 7, 8 uh, were set? Uh, there was actually probably several names. Uh, I couldn't tell you today which one we even settled on. Uh, maybe Greg could jump in on some forum sometime, but uh, it really wasn't part of the, the, the big picture for the product, so uh, I don't think it was a big deal. But I know there's fans who, they like every little detail to, to, to come out. Uh, at some point it, was, it became known that you had a passion for car racing, so is it still something you're interested in? Yes, that's my other love, is, uh, is sports car and auto racing, and I've been doing it it's non-stop now for 20 years, and uh, it's funny you just asked. So last weekend I was at uh, Mazda Laguna Seca Raceway and uh, run, uh, actually won my third uh, national championship. Uh, so it was very exciting. So wh why, why did you decide to actually uh, mostly left the science fiction elements out of Heroes? Well, I think a lot of that had to do with the fan feedback, as you mentioned uh, earlier. Mind Magic had a little bit of science fiction at the end, but Heroes really wanted to be a pure fantasy uh, strategy series, and then when we added RPG sense to it, it just didn't, didn't really need the, the, RP, the uh, science fiction background. Of all the worlds uh, of Might and Magic, and there's been quite a few, uh, from Varn and Crown and Terra and Xeon and all the, the ones that followed, um, what's your personal favorite playground, basically? Well, I think World of Xeon was probably my favorite. It was the pinnacle of the story of you know all five games led to the to the finale and uh, it brought it all together uh, and that was kind of the end of my story for Might and Magic at the end of uh, World of Zine. So that was probably definitely definitely my favorite. Um, maybe a more philosophical question I guess but uh, what's your main goal when you create a game? Is it uh, the fun, the interesting plot, as a really the, having interesting and unique gameplay experience or a bit of everything, basically? 
Well, true, it's a, it's a bit of everything. Uh, I think there's a little bit of selfishness in there, and I do like to create games that I myself love to play indefinitely. And it just such a great feeling to be able to create something that so many people out there can, uh, can enjoy and uh, have a great time with. And then there's, of course, the financial uh, uh, responsibility, but for me it's always been, I hope it makes enough so I can make another one. Originally there was Might and Magic the RPG, then came Heroes, the strategy game, and little by little there were other attempts to uh, try other genres, uh, like action games and stuff like that. Uh, for you, what, what would be the, the genre you'd like to see Might and Magic try, basically? Well, well we. We did want to make an MMO out of it. That it was an attempt there that we never got to finish. Uh, I really did like the direction of Dark Messiah that Ubisoft did. I thought that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed, enjoyed playing that. Uh, I've seen some handheld games and some browser games. I, I think they're all they're all cool. But uh, uh, any any more of the games is just great with me. Okay. And so the last fan question is really about uh, Might and Magic Online that you mentioned. Uh, so, uh, did you regret uh, never uh, getting to, to finish this project, basically? Oh, absolutely. We had such amazing plans for to take Might and Magic, Might and Magic to uh, online uh, RPGs. I saw them evolving, I saw them moving to an online to be able to play together with your friends, and I really wanted to make a version of Might and Magic that could go that direction and be online where you could play together with, uh, with people you knew and, and go on adventures. So, I would have loved to have made one of the early uh, MMOs, but uh, just didn't happen. So thank you very much for participating today in this interview, and also thank you for creating Might and Magic and Heroes and giving us gamers so many hours and nights of fun and just one more turn, uh, especially with Heroes in these last 20 years. And we really hope at Ubisoft that you will enjoy uh, Heroes 7 when it comes out in late September. I look forward to playing it and thank you so very much for having me here, I uh, really appreciate it.